Hello and welcome to my full bookshelf. My name is Felicia, and today we're talking about the books that I read in the month of June. So let's get started. The first one that I read is The Address Gold by Elizabeth Ames. Uh, this book is some sort of coming of age literary fiction story that follows the lives of four main characters. They meet each other in college, so it's sort of like the, the beginning of university, I think, in the United States. You understand that they live together, they really like each other, and they become really good friends, which is a great premise to me for a lot of books. A lot of people said that this book was going to be similar to A Little Life in terms of the feelings that made you feel and the kind of relationship that the four characters develop with each other and also with other people. For me, it could be more different. Yes, it does follow four main characters and yes, um, it follows them throughout a decade of their life. At the same time, it is not as hard as a little life in terms of reading experience and also the kind of content. Um, I gave this book four stars. Uh, the reason why I gave this book four stars is because I felt like it was a little bit too short. One thing that we know about these four characters from the very beginning is that when they meet each other, one of them has done something very bad and three of them will be doing something really bad throughout the years. We don't know what this thing's out, we don't even know what the one person who already committed this bad act or something like that. I can't remember the precise word, I should have tapped it. But you sort of know that there is a little bit of darkness in every single character and that is completely normal because as humans we are all flawed and we tend to do things that are not necessarily good things all the time. So I really enjoyed that aspect. Um, the one thing that I was saying I did not particularly enjoy, or at least that didn't make this book a five star read, um, is the fact that it was a little bit too short. I felt like I wanted to know more about the characters and obviously having four characters it doesn't let you go too much into detail with their own lives in 300 or so pages, yeah 365 pages. Um, so I wanted to see a little bit more of their lives and how they get to the point where they get. But it was still a really enjoyable read. I did not expect this book to deal with topics such as um, motherhood, uh, infertility and all that because when you read a book about women you don't necessarily see those topics um, addressed and I really appreciated that even though obviously I cannot personally relate to that but at the same time I think it's really important to read about this kind of thing. I almost found this link between the way this book described the concept of love with ancient Greek uh, philosophy, so love that can easily become a powerful force that almost destroys you, whether that is love towards yourself or towards another individual. And that was really, really um, good to read. It's something that you don't necessarily see in many books and it's also because you tend to see a lot of love as a driving force to do good, whereas here you see love as a driving force that leads you to do something bad sometimes. So. Um, yeah, good read. Give it four stars. I can't wait to read something else by Elizabeth Ames because I enjoyed her prose. So let's go to the next book. The next book that I read is The Dutch House by Anne Patchett. This is the first book that I read by Anne Patchett, but obviously I know that she is a really well-known author and I really want to read her book Commonwealth at some point this year or next year. This being said, um, this book follows the story of our main character Danny who is a teenage boy when the book starts and is a grown up man by the time the book finishes. So this book is a work of literary fiction but at the same time it has elements of historical fiction and also um, coming of age sort of fiction. Um, the prose is fantastic and the story itself is quite unique. It is unique in the sense that you do not have, you don't necessarily have a storyline. You do have a timeline and throughout that timeline things happen. So Danny and his sister are teenagers when the story starts and you know from the beginning that their mother is not part of the picture. You do know that the mother is not dead even though the father keeps referring to their mother as dead. Uh, you know that she left them and went to India. This is something I'm not spoiling for you, it's something that you know pretty much from the beginning. Um, they live in this beautiful house from which the title of the book comes and this house is so well described throughout the book. It's a massive house, it has 
three floors, um, a large back garden. Um, it is spectacular. Everybody that comes through the driveway sort of uh, is amazed by this house. And the house is what shapes their life because obviously um, they have to deal with the fact that they do not have a mother when they grow up but at the same time that doesn't seem to shape them as much as the events that relate to the house. What happens and this is, I mean this is not really a spoiler because you'll realise that this is going to happen pretty soon on but they, Maeve and Danny face a pretty big tragic event when they're still growing up and based on the outcome of that event, then they they no longer live in the house. And the entire story, it can almost be read as a love story, as a love letter, as in brotherly, siblingly love, um, from the brother to the sister, talking about the house and how the house was important in their um, in their present and also in their future. I don't want to give too much away and that's why I'm not go going into detail with regards to the story. Um, but let me just tell you, the prose was fantastic and Patrick has this way of describing things that is very meticulous but at the same time it's so important to have something like that done by an author because that is how you get to know the place that you're reading about and this that house, I felt like I was right there, like if I close my eyes right now, I can perfectly see it and I can picture myself going from room to room. So it's an incredible story. I know a lot of people didn't particularly like this book and I know a lot of people who loved it. I definitely side with the people who loved it because I gave it five stars. I think the reason why it resonated so much with me, even though I've not gone through anything like that with my personal experience, is because I do have a place like the Dash House that I associate with a big chunk of my life and also because I do have a brother who's slightly younger than me just like Maeve and Danny in this book they have a sort of small age gap between them um, and I don't know it just felt like it could be something that I would want my brother to read I have recommended it to him I don't think he's picked it up yet next up we have The Blue Eye by Toni Morrison this is a book um, I picked up this book because I've been meaning to read it for years but I was always a, lot, uh, a little bit intimidated by it. I knew the incident of the story, the fact that it follows the, the story of this black girl who desperately wants to have blue eye, hence the name of the book, and that's all I knew. But I could tell from this tiny little thing I knew about the story that it was not going to be an easy read. It was definitely not an easy read, even though it's a small book. Um, as you've seen, I've tapped something in it uh, because this is the book club pick for my book club for the month of July. So I can't wait to discuss this with the other people in the book club. The main character is Pecola or Pecola, even though she is not the one to tell the story. We do see the story from the eyes of multiple characters. The one child who really wants to have blue eyes is called Pecola or Pecola and she comes from this incredibly poor black family and throughout the book one thing that is very emphasized is how, how ugly Pecola or Pecola is and how ugly are her parents. This ugliness is something that she perceives even though other people might not perceive necessarily as the first thing they see about her. It's set in the United States and there is still a lot of discrimination based on colour and even within the black community there is a lot of discrimination based on the shade of black that you are so there is a lot of colorism also within the black community based on this book at that time at that point in time one thing that i notice while reading this book is you see how much somebody's life as an adult or as a teenager can be shaped by the events that happen in childhood and that does not refer just to the main character, but you see this happening with every single character that is discussed in the story. You see the importance of love and self-love and how it com comes into play in the way of it based on what we wish for our future. And for this main character, the key thing that she wished for was blue eyes. It is worth reading this because you do realise how everyday comforts such as having I don't know such as having food on the table that is different from day to day or such as having running water in in the house 
can make such a big difference in many other aspects of life and that can lead to many more consequences for yourself and for people that interact with you throughout your life whether they are related to you or not. This book generally broke my heart. I finished it and I had a bit of a cry. Um, the main character, I, I just wish I could give her a hug. And this book really made me feel very bad about myself and also made me open my eyes about realities because while this is a fictional story, it, I'm sure that a lot of people have faced a lot of difficulties and a lot of struggles that I'll mention in this book. So it really makes you look, take a hard look at yourself and reevaluate your own experience. So I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I sort of got over the fact that I was intimidated by it. And I can't wait to read more by Toni Morrison. The next book that I read last month was South of the Border, West of the Sun by Haruki Murakami. This is a very sweet story. Obviously, I am incredibly passionate about Murakami's writing. I find his prose so easy to get lost into. And I read this in less than a week while I was going through a bit of a tough situation at work. It was a very stressful week. Um, and it generally took me to a whole different planet. Um, just like pretty much every Murakami story, this is set in Japan. And this is set in Japan in the post-war Japan, so from the 60s onwards, 60s, 70s onwards. Um, the main character is this boy who then turns into an adolescent and then a man, so he sort of follows his life. He's an only child in a time in Japan when most families have more than one child. And he relates his experience of being an only child to another only child that is in his elementary school class. Her name is Shimamoto. What is special about Shimamoto is that she she has a limp in one of her legs because she had, um, I believe it's polio when she was a kid. But because she had this sort of limp and because she was an only child, children did not want to play with her um, that much. Ajima was one of the people who played with her, they built this beautiful friendship and they sort of cultivated this friendship until they reached adolescence where um, Ajima moved to a different city with his parents and Shimamoto stayed in the original village for a couple of years until she also moved away from the village. The, it is quite clear that Ajima has feelings for Shimamoto and it's quite clear that Shimamoto has feelings for Ajima when they're growing up but at the same time neither of them acts on it. They don't hear from each other for years and years and years until one day Ajima, um, who by the time the story um, picks up again, is married, has children, and is the owner of some successful jazz bars. His bar gets some attention and ends up being mentioned in a magazine, um, and he sees a lot of his childhood friends and adolescent friends and university friends showing up to say congratulations to him for putting together such a nice bar. Um, one evening, one of the people that goes to see him at the jazz bar is Shimamoto, and she's very cryptic. We don't know anything about her. We just know that she lived <laughs> and she somehow ended up being in the bar. Um, she is, as I said, very mysterious. You can tell that there is a lot of darkness associated to whatever happened to her in those years. She does not disclose much to Ajime until she discloses a little bit while they go on a sort of one day adventure away from the city. I don't want to obviously spoil the ending, but in true more kind of fashion, it has that element of not really mystery, but mystery of life. And it has an element of also almost magical realism, even though the entire story cannot be classified as magical realism, but it does leave a lot of question marks at the end that you, you are left to answer yourself, basically. Um, I gave this book four stars just because I wish it was a little bit longer. I wanted to know a little bit more, but at the same time I think I perfectly know why it's so short because had he added any more information about anything or any of the characters, then this book would not keep that sort of element of mystery that makes it so special. It's a really nice read. As I said, it's very short. Um, if you want to start reading Murakami, but at the same time you don't really want to go into the hardcore magical realism like Kafka and the Shaw or Killing Commendador, I would definitely recommend this book. It's very short. Worst case scenario, you don't like 200 pages, you might give Murakami another try at some point or decide that it's not for you. 
And this leads me to my last book. I definitely saved the best for last. This was my favourite book of the entire month and you know how much I love the Dutch house but this was just a step further. Um, I'm talking about Hurricane Season by um, Fernanda Melker and translated by Sophie Hughes from Original Spanish. The story starts, we know that the witch of the village is dead. Then the story goes into detail with regards to the actual history of the witch. And you know that the witch is not the original witch. There was another witch who died before her. And then and then it goes on to describe the various storylines of the characters in the village, especially associated to one or two families, um, that have interacted with the witch and are potentially suspects of her murder. Because one thing that we know is that her body is found by a river and that uh, immediately we sort of either suspect ourselves or we're told by some characters that she was murdered. Basically, this is a portrait of family life, personal life and a lot of issues that Mexican society, especially in villages, faces even now. There is a lot of talk about drug and substance abuse. There is a lot of talk about emotional and physical abuse. A lot of talk about discrimination between men and women and how this sort of macho culture is still quite relevant in Mexican villages, especially this one. And also religious belief mixed with sort of superstition and how that affects everyday life in villages like this one. This is a story of fiction, but you can tell that the author has definitely put research, if not personal experience, I don't know, um, into crafting this amazing book. The reason why I say it's so hard to read is because it's incredibly graphic as well. You can see you, you read about abuse and you almost feel it on your own skin. Especially reading this book as a woman, I felt very much in danger, even though obviously I was in the comfort of my home. Um, but it made me sad and angry thinking of all those realities of people who unfortunately cannot escape those abuse situations, where there is um, some sort of pattern of emotional and physical abuse or whether that becomes some sort of self-destructive self -disruptive behaviour uh, in terms of su substance abuse. The other thing that this book deals with is LGBTQ+, especially focus on trans people and how they are perceived in society and how, especially in this sort of village-like Mexican society, and how you can see that being gay is still not alright, how being trans is still not alright, and how people around you still perceive you as something less than an actual human being, and hence their behaviour towards you as a gay or transgender or lesbian person is going to be affected by the preconception of your sexuality. This book needs to be read. And obviously, as I said, it comes with a disclaimer, so if you have been personally affected by this kind of topics, you might want to reconsider or sort of go in slowly into this. The one thing I really enjoyed about the prose is that it's very... Uh, how do I describe it? The prose for this book is... It's like being submerged by a bunch of words that describe many different aspects of reality and then after being bombarded by all this stimuli, which in this case are words, then you, you sort of find yourself in the word, but it, it, it is this, there is this transition between chapter one, where you sort of take in all this information, you're like, what am I reading about? All these names, all these people, all this stuff happening, how is this going to relate? And then by chapter two, you're like, part of the village, you, you see yourself walking the streets of the village, you see yourself going to tiny dirty rooms, you see yourself uh, dealing with corruption and all that and it's a heartbreaking book, it deserves five stars if not more. This is also part of the International Booker Prize shortlist 
and as you know I've read Discomfort of Evening a couple of months ago, loved it, but I think this one, just because of how powerful this is, I think this is probably a book that I love even more than that. And um, yeah, it was an experience, a true journey, do read if you have the chance. Well, this leads me to the end of this video. Thank you so much for sticking by. If you watch until the end, do let me know. Leave a thumbs up, maybe, or maybe subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. As I said in the previous video, I'm still quite new to this whole YouTube sit-down video, so leave any feedback or comments you have down in the description, in the sorry, in the comments bit. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Bye.